Well, good morning. And uh, today we're starting something new. I'm going to upload a short passage each day from a piece of writing that was made in 1869. This is the Theological Review for 1869. It's from the library at Bali. And I'm going to retell the story that John James Taylor told of his visit to the Unitarian churches in Transylvania in 1868. Now he was invited to attend the 300th anniversary of the granting of the Edict of Torda in that year and I was honoured and privileged to be invited to the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torda in 2018, 150 years after John James Taylor. So the story is of interest uh, to me because of that. It's also interesting because I think everybody, particularly in times when we're locked down, people like to hear stories of travel. And this is a remarkable one, written at a time when travel to Eastern Europe was rare. Travel for people like the Reverend John James Taylor wasn't that uncommon uh, in the mid-19th century. And indeed, he had spent some years in Germany, as a lot of theological scholars did. John James Taylor was one of the leaders of Unitarian thought in Britain in the mid-19th century. Uh, alongside James Martineau and John Hamilton Tom and Charles Wicksteed, he was named as one of the so-called Quaternion. He was a great scholar, a great theologian, a great thinker, and someone who had um, led the way towards uh, a more spiritual type of religious devotion. He was the minister of uh, Upper Brook Street Chapel, which was built during his ministry, the first, first Gothic example of a nonconformist church in England. He also became in time the principal of Manchester College, and um, it was when he was principal he was invited to visit uh, Transylvania. So I'm going to read a short passage from this account. It's from the Theological Review for January 1869. And we'll follow uh, Taylor's journey uh, to Transylvania. And uh, where I have appropriate images, I'll put some, some pictures up to accompany the text. And we should remember, of course, that it's very much of its time. Uh, but it's still a very, very interesting early account of uh, an encounter between the British Unitarian and Transylvania. So, narrative of a visit to the Unitarian churches of Transylvania. On occasion of the 300th anniversary of the first proclamation of religious freedom at Torda in 1568. In the spring of 1868, I and my colleagues in Manchester New College received a very cordial invitation from the Bishop of the Unitarian Churches in Transylvania, speaking in the name of the consistory over which he presides, and warmly seconded by the urgent request of some of our former pupils from that country, to be present at the approaching celebration of the 300th anniversary of the foundation of their church with the first proclamation of religious liberty at Torda in 1568. Circumstances prevented my two colleagues from complying with this request, but the occasion was in itself so attractive and the opportunity of visiting a remote and interesting region, peopled from the very dawn of the Reformation by the professors of Unitarian Christianity, which under any public and organised form is a comparatively recent phenomenon in the Western world, seemed to me so little likely to occur again that I determined under the provisional conditions of continued health and strength to accept the invitation. The British and Foreign Unitarian Association, hearing of my intention, requested me to be the bearer of an address of congratulation 
to the Transylvanian Brethren and to represent the English Unitarians on this occasion. A similar address was confided to me by the members of the West Riding Unitarian Association. Both these commissions I very heartily undertook. Such were the circumstances under which I visited Transylvania. It will perhaps facilitate the better understanding of some particulars in the ensuing narrative if I premise a very few remarks on the peculiar institutions and mixed population of Hungary generally, and on the past history and present condition of the Unitarian churches in Transylvania, its sharply defined and strongly featured southeastern division, at one time an independent principality under sovereigns of its own. The Hungarians proper, or Magyars, Though they have given their name to the wide extent of territory which is enclosed on three sides within a natural boundary by the Carpathians, form a decided minority of the population of the country, which they share with races differing from them in language, religion and origin. Wallachs, Slavonians and Germans. Mr. Padgett has marked the habitat of these several races by different colours in the excellent map which he has prefixed to his account of Hungary and Transylvania, and which exhibits a complete mosaic work, inlaid as it were in separate groups or masses on the face of the soil, though the Wallachs are pretty equably diffused as a peasantry through the districts occupied by the Magyars and the Saxons. The Magyars are an intrusive and conquering race, until lately formed a dominant or noble class, enjoying political and social privileges above the other inhabitants of the land. This has been altered since the recent revolution, which has put all these different races on a footing of legal equality. It was the old policy of the Austrian government by fomenting the mutual jealousies which the state of things produced to keep the country divided and weak. The Wallachs, who claim a descent from the old Roman provincials of Dacia, and who like to call themselves Daco Romani, speaking a Romanic dialect closely allied to the Italian and Latin, were, prior to the revolution, in a condition little superior to actual serfdom. They were not indeed attached to the soil, a scripti glebi, subject to be bought and sold with the estate, but a certain amount of unrecompensed labour was due from them every week to their lord, and they could not remove to another locality without some arrangement for furnishing him with an acceptable substitution. He exercised a summary jurisdiction over them, with the power of imprisonment and of inflicting a certain number of stripes. They bore, moreover, with the corresponding class throughout the land, the entire weight of taxation. By recent changes, they have been converted into a free peasantry, and the taxes are now levied equally on all classes. Education is slowly spreading among them, and they have journals in their own language, which often advocate, it is said, views not altogether in harmony with the objects of the present Liberal government, and inspired, it is suspected, by the secret influence of Russia. Without great wisdom in the treatment of this susceptible population, danger may arise from this quarter to the steady progress of constitutional freedom in Hungary. These were the semi-barbarous people whom the Camarilla at Vienna twenty years ago, to blind Europe to the true character of the Hungarian movement, wickedly stirred up in secret against their legal masters and indirectly urged on to the commission of horrible atrocities. The Wallachs, I believe, belong exclusively to the Greek Church, of which there are two divisions one acknowledging the Patriarch of Constantinople as its head, the other in communion with the Church of Rome. Of these, the latter is decidedly the most cultivated and intelligent. The Wallachs are a wild, fierce-looking people with sharp aquiline features and long black hair hanging in dishevelled masses over their cheeks and shoulders. 
On the whole, they have a striking appearance, and their women are often handsome. Their picturesque costume and heavy roof cottages with an aperture in the overhanging thatch for the escape of the smoke, and their small churches surmounted by graceful little belfries, furnish capital subjects for the artist and gave the charm of novelty to several striking points of view in the romantic wooded district which we traversed between Grosswardine and Klausenberg. When we passed through that region, the Wallachs were busy carrying in their rude wagons drawn by magnificent oxen the materials for the railway which is now in process of construction and which it is proposed to carry ultimately beyond Klausenberg to the Black Sea. A work which, when completed, will have a wonderful effect in developing the vast resources of the country through its whole extent. As I looked one day on the grotesque groups of Wallachs reposing with their cattle at noon in the marketplace of the little town where we stopped to dine, I could not resist the thought how strange it was to see, as it were, the 2nd and the 19th century brought thus into immediate juxtaposition. The representatives and possibly the descendants of the provincials of the age of Trajan employed in carrying the effect the very last results of modern engineering skill. The Germans, or as they are called in Hungary, the Saxons, from a very early date formed settlements in the country. They are dispersed in small insulated knots or clusters of population all over the land, tenaciously retentive of their language, manners and customs. Their chief district is in the far east under the Carpathians and adjoining the Seclers. It is called Saxon land, well cultivated and filled with an industrious and intelligent people. Hermannstadt, its capital, which I regret I had not the opportunity of visiting, is, I am told, in every respect, a completely German town. The Saxons are, I believe, everywhere adherents of the Lutheran faith. The Slavonic races, which are dispersed along the northern and southern frontiers of the country, are, with some exceptions among the Slovaks of the north, attached to the Greek church. The rest of Hungary, exclusive of the Unitarians, of whom I shall speak presently, is divided between the Catholics and the Calvinists, or Reformed. They form the richest part of the population, and to these two communions most of the gentry and nobility now belong. The Catholic Church clergy, I was told, by an extreme liberal, are as a body tolerant and patriotic, and not at all infected with ultramontan tendencies. In fact, the common struggle for freedom has had a great effect in softening down religious antipathies and causing the members of the four different religions recognised by the laws to look on each other with mutual kindness and sympathy. As yet, the Unitarians have not a single church in Hungary proper. They are confined entirely to Transylvania, or as it's called by the Germans, Siebenbergen from the seven great fortresses which it once possessed, when it had to protect itself almost daily against the invasions of the Turks. It is remarkable that the most decidedly Hungarian district in the country, where the oldest and purest Magyar blood is said to flow in the veins of the inhabitants, should be at this day the chief seat and stronghold of Unitarianism. The Hungarians affirm that there have been three immigrations of Magyars into their country. The earliest under Attila in the 5th century, that of a tribe of the same race, the Avars, and the last and most general one which spread the Magyars over the whole surface of the land. We slept one night on our return home at a small town inhabited by people of Avar descent who still retain some peculiar usages and intermarry among themselves, though they speak Magyar and belong to the Reformed Church. They keep themselves aloof from the Wallachs, to whom they are said to be superior in manners and cultivation. As travellers passing through the town, we should not have been struck with any marked difference of appearance. The settlers who occupied the extreme east of the country 
close under the Carpathians, claim to be descended from the immediate followers of Attila, and are not a little proud of this distinction. It is, I am told, a beautiful and well-cultivated region, peopled by an intelligent and energetic race. Here Unitarianism is in great force, defended perhaps by its remote and secluded position from the influences which have undermined it elsewhere. Its churches cover the land. Here is one of the three gymnasia, which are alone left to the Unitarians the many which they once possessed. The Foy Ispan, or Lord Lieutenant of the County, Gabriel Daniel, a gentleman of very prepossessing manners and appearance to whom I was introduced at Torda, is a zealous Unitarian and has been a most liberal benefactor to the gymnasium at Kerestor, a town in secular land. From the same district come Bishop Kreiser and his wife, and the pulpits of the Unitarian churches are chiefly furnished with preachers from secular families. I regret nothing more that I had not the opportunity of visiting a district so full of interest. It would be highly satisfactory to know more of the origin of the Magyar race and of their beliefs and manners when heathens. Some think there was a predisposition in them from the first to a grand and simple monotheism, and that, like the ancient Germans, they had already thrown off the thraldom of some of their original superstitions when they came in contact with Christendom. Their speech is unique among the languages of Europe, connected only by a few slight affinities with the Finnish and the Turkish. Those who have studied it say that it possesses great power and expressiveness. To the ear it is rich and sonorous. To judge from their facility of extemporaneous utterance, the people seem born orators. The words flow in a full and gushing stream from their lips without hindrance or hesitation, while their animated action and dark flashing eyes render their eloquence impressive even to those who cannot follow its sense. The question whence they came and where the roots of their mysterious language are to be found is already stimulating the researches of their scholars. An enthusiastic Magyar disguised as a dervish and helped by a marvellous mastery of Asiatic dialects, penetrated some years ago at the constant risk of his life into the very heart of Central Asia to investigate this ethnological problem, but returned, I believe, without completely solving it. Bishop Kreitzer's favourite researches point in the same direction, though they do not carry him quite so far. He has been employed for years in collecting the remains of the popular poetry and legends of his native secular land, and he enjoys a high reputation among his countrymen as a writer on such subjects. The first volume of a work published a few years ago with the alluring title Wild Roses is kindly presented to the Library of Manchester New College, and I trust that ere long we may have access to its contents through the medium of some German, French or English translation. With respect to the early conversion of the Magyars to Christianity, I was requested by my friend Mr Samuel Sharp to inquire if there was ground for believing that George of Cappadocia, the Arian, sometimes identified with the patron saint of England, had contributed to bring about that event. I could not find that there was any evidence pointing to such a conclusion. I observed indeed on the tympanum of the western porch of the principal church in Klausenberg an elegant Gothic structure once possessed by the Unitarians, a spirited bat relief representing a conflict between some saint or hero and a monster, and it occurred to me that this might be St George. On inquiry, however, I found it was the Archangel Michael, who in Catholic times was regarded as the tutelary saint of Transylvania, and to whom many other churches in that country are dedicated. It seems to me on general grounds highly improbable that George of Cappadocia could have had anything to do with the conversion of the Magyars. He belongs to the 4th century when Arianism, as the religion of the court, was fashionable and dominant. Attila did not invade Europe till the 5th, 
when the reign of Arianism was already over. Moreover, the Hungarians continued heathens for 500 years after this time. Their general conversion dates, if I mistake not, from the 10th century, when they became the objects of a comp competitive proselytism from the Greek and Roman churches. George, after all, Arian as he was and saint as he may have been, was not a very respectable personages, personage. And for the credit of our Transylvanian friends, we, we, we need not, I think, be very anxious to establish any close spiritual relationship between them. Well, we'll leave our story here and continue our abridged reading through John James Taylor's account of his travels to Transylvania in 1868. We'll continue tomorrow and every day I'll upload a new section from his writings.